Well, welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Education of Castro Valley Unified School District. It's September 22nd, 2021, and I will call the meeting to order and ask if there are, I'm told there are no requests to speak on topics on the closed session agenda. So hearing that, we will adjourn to closed session and we'll, we will be back here live at six o'clock roughly. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can't see us. We're gone. Okay, I will call the uh, meeting back to order. Welcome to everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Education of Castro Valley Unified, September 22nd, 2021. Uh, I welcome to everybody who's in the room especially our special guests from the high school and everybody who's online with us. I will note that uh, Trustee Whitaker will not be with us tonight and we look forward to having her back with us in the very near future. Uh, the board did take action in closed session tonight by a vote of four to zero. The board voted to appoint Kevin Rosario as director of special education pending his clearance from his current district. So moving on, our next item is approval of the agenda. Do we have any amendments to the agenda this week? Yes. Nope, we're good to go. I'll move to approve the agenda. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you both. Moved and seconded. Is there any uh, further discussion? Hearing none, we'll take the vote. Uh, welcome, Jennifer, your vote. Hi, yes. Great, thank you. Mike? Yes. Holly? Yes. Dot? And I'll vote yes. And so the agenda is approved four to zero. Uh, we'll go to the mission statement. Dolly, thank you very much for reading the mission statement. Sure. Uh, in, a, in partnership with the community, Castro Valley Unified School District educates students in a learning environment that is safe, nurturing, and culturally responsive. Students are guided by excellent inspired staff, utilizing innovative instruction, curricula, and technology. Thank you, Dolly. Uh, it's a quick review of the Brown Act for the benefit of all of us. The board respects and encourages the public to comment on matters on the board agenda and within the board's jurisdiction. The board fully supports civil discourse and requests that everyone respect each other and their point of view. Individuals who would like to address the board must complete a request to speak form, the blue forms on the back table, or via the Google form on the district's website and submit it prior to the start of the agenda item. At the discretion of the board president, speaker cards may be accepted after the start of the agenda item. Your name will be called and you will either come to the podium to speak or be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comment. After the allotted time, then you will be re-muted. Individual speakers are asked to limit their comments to no more than three minutes, unless the board decides otherwise. There are up to 30 minutes of public comment allowed on each agenda item. With board consensus, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed. This meeting is being recorded to prepare the official minutes. And one last comment, to comply with the Brown Act, the board may listen to comments from the speakers under public comment, item seven, but can neither discuss nor take action on the issues presented. So moving right along to our student board member report. Jennifer. Hi, thank you. Um, so it's now been about six weeks into the 21-22 school year. The Castro Valley High School Trojans football team had their first home game and tailgate about two weeks ago against Granada High School. Um, unfortunately, we lost both JV and YC games, but the turnout was great and ex students were extremely excited for the return of those Friday night lights. 
Um, September 15th was the beginning of Hispanic and Latino Heritage Month, and several schools across the district are currently celebrating Latino culture through events and resources provided. The Siblings for Change Club at CVHS is currently holding a school supply donation drive for students impacted by foster care, and students are dropping off donations to classrooms in 700 Hall. CVHS has also had their semi-yearly um, week-long co-ed dodgeball tournament where 13 teams fought for the Golden Plunger, and many students were really happy to see the return of this event after COVID, you know? Also, homecoming is around the corner for CVHS. It's going to be October 2nd to October 9th. Our theme this year is called Dream World, and um, this includes each class's sub theme being a different realm, you could call it, such as underwater, space, Neverland, and superheroes. Um, last but not least, we have some fundraisers coming up for some schools. This Friday, actually, September 24th, CVHS will be having a Vitality Bowl fundraiser in the Castro Village, and 15% of all proceeds will be donated to CVHS. Also, next Wednesday, September 29th, Stanton is going to be having a fundraiser at Nations Giant Hamburgers on Castro Valley Boulevard, and 20% of all those proceeds will be donated back to Stanton. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, our special guest tonight, Castro Valley High School. We're thrilled to have you here with us. Yes, well, welcome. Uh, Mr. Torpy is here with his team, and we're really excited to hear what you have to share. Thank you, Ms. Amadi. Thank you, Castro Valley Unified Board of Education. It is such an honor to be here. Jennifer, thank you. We are so happy to be back here with you. It's been a long time since we've been able to be in this room and to share this moment with you and to share our school and what our students, students have been doing. Um, I think one of the most valuable things that we have been seeing in our students is their resilience and ability to bounce back. Uh, they have come to school with incredible enthusiasm, joy. Um, you know, there have been challenges, you know, absolutely. Um, but the, the spirit that everyone has been bringing has allowed us to overcome those challenges, accept them, embrace them, uh, and it's just been fantastic. And so um, what I want to start with is in our presentation here, I might need my glasses, sorry, new, the, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the welcome back. Mr. Baker made an outstanding welcome back video. Mr. Logan's here to talk a little bit about our standards-based grading. Uh, and we have a short video by Zoe Dorado, who is the Alameda County Youth Poet Laureate and amazing CBHS student. And then uh, we have some students here that are gonna share with you the work that they've been doing with the Broadcast Club. And, the, and what I just wanna point out before I um, invite Mr. Baker up to show the video is that, um, you know, when we think about things like the Broadcast Club, like that was designed to connect the community to the things that we were still trying to do at school during, uh, you know, distance learning. So, you know, much of this is just really connected to uh, how hard the school community has been working to, to kind of stay together, stay connected. And I'm just very proud of them. And I'm very proud to be a part of this. Uh, so I'd like to invite Assistant Principal Kevin Baker up to uh, talk a little bit about our welcome back. Thank you very much, Mr. Torby. Thank you. Thank you all for allowing us to be here and to just uh, share uh, the work that we're doing with the CVHS community. And so um, I want to be brief and I really want to let the students speak for themselves, which is why I created this uh, short video. Um, we did have a, a special welcome back assembly that I think was a great time for everybody and they got to feel like they're back in the school community. And now here we have um, some students kind of sharing in their own words how it feels to be back. So how's it feel being back in school? Being back in school feels really good. I guess I had to connect with my friends again, and I'm just happy that I'm back in class. And instead of typing, my eyes feel a lot better. So school's a lot easier now because we're in person and talk to teachers rather than being limited by the screen in front of us, and I feel a lot more connected to campus. And 
the opportunities on school are a lot better because we have access to the wellness center and just being able to be social with everyone here. All right, that last one I like a lot. The students feel motivated again, and that's super important for all of us. I'll let Mr. Torp be introduced our next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Baker. <clears throat> so speaking of teachers, I could have sworn one of those students said, I miss my principal, but I didn't hear that. Um, but they did, the constant theme was uh, teachers. And so I'd like to introduce Mr. Trent Logan to talk a little bit about our standards-based grading. Uh, he's, whoa. Uh, there you go. Anyway, speaking of teachers, I actually know how to do this tech. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Logan, thank you. You'd be surprised. I still mess up all the time. Um, so, hello, I'm Trent Logan. Um, I'm going to share quickly, um, try to keep it under two minutes, um, standards based grading and what it looks like at the high school. So, a group of teachers were part of a pilot program where we read the Grading for Equity book by Joe Feldman. And uh, a lot of us were inspired to try this in practice. So we got together and there are about 20 of us from all secondary sites, including both middle schools and both high schools that are trying many of the policies as outlined in Joe Feldman's book, but also Robert Marzano's book, Standards-Based Grading and Formative Assessments. Um, we've uh, basically been trying to apply what he's talked about and this idea of um, the way he's described what uh, many of us already know that traditional schooling is not really designed to be fair, equitable. It is an outdated and old way of teaching. Um, and so it's trying to radically change things to make school more equitable, more fair, um, to make things more consistent for students, to make things more um, accurate and also more bias resistant. Um, so I won't go through all of this because it's a lot of information, but I wanted it here in case you're curious. Um, Standards-based grading and grading for equity, um, both terms are interchangeable, according to Feldman, um, focuses on these key eight policies. Um, there are others as well. This is the key things. There's, um, to even simplify things further, three key ones. It's this idea that a student's grade is determined by their ability to meet specific course standards, which are checked through um, accurate assessments. And that means that homework and classwork and other behavior and habits grades are not included in their GPA or in the gradebook those habits and behavior and homework and classwork are still extremely important because it prepares students to actually do well in the assessment. The issue with this is students oftentimes feel more stress and also it means that a student at the beginning of a semester can do better than another because they've had more background or support before that moment. So the idea is to um, allow students to reassess for full credit. The only thing that should matter is can they meet the skill? It doesn't matter when and it doesn't matter in what format as long as they're meeting the standard. Um, there are other things as well, like not giving extra credit, um, making sure that students understand why they're being assessed and what is um, going to um, be on the assessment. Um, we believe that these tenants will lead to a much more bias resistant, accurate and motivating grading system when applied in <laughs> completion. There are some teachers who are trying this um, to smaller degrees, but we're really trying to do everything. We're jumping in with both feet first. Um, we really strongly believe this is better for all students, but specifically um, low achieving students, English language learners, students who are in special education, students of color. Um, I also think it's better for high achieving students who are feeling a lot of stress about school. Um, there's oftentimes this idea that we're not pushing students hard enough, but also their mental health is deteriorating. So how do you push them harder without making that worse? Uh, I see standards based grading as that answer. Um, so that's, that's it. I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah. So we, have, we have a lot of staff who have been working on that and uh, Mr. Logan's been, uh, he's probably met with 35 teachers trying to help them kind of guide, guide them through it. So he's been instrumental in, a, in this effort. 
<clears throat> Zoe Dorado wasn't able to be here at the meeting with us tonight, um, so she made us a short video, and I'll uh, share that with you. Uh, so she is the Alameda County Youth Poet Laureate, and, uh, and what you'll hear is just an amazing story about how Castro Valley schools, the community, the education that, that you provide for them, um, you know, really inspired uh, her work. And let's see, uh, it's sponsored by the Alameda County Library and uh, the uh, Alameda County Library Foundation. And I did credit the graphics that I took from the website. So I'm working on my appropriate citations. All right, here's Zoe Dorado. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zoe. I'm 16. I'm a junior at Castor Valley High. Um, I'm the Alameda County Youth Poet Laureate um, this year, which I'm excited about. And I like writing poems. Um, I think I got into poetry you know, there's like this sort of full lineage of, um, you know, poetry units you've had since elementary school and throughout middle school. But I think it was my eighth grade English class um, at Creekside. Um, and we had a poetry unit. We were going to do a poetry cafe at the end of the year. Um, I think that was the moment where I was able to really get into poetry, mainly because of spoken word poetry. And I think that's the my, my favorite kind of poetry, I mean, uh, because you're able to have be in the space where you're sharing poetry with each other. Um, someone's on stage, you have an audience, and there's sort of this like relationship you have um, with the people listening to you. And being able to have that experience and being able to see like classmates that I've known since kindergarten share something that I didn't know that was a part of their lives um, was, I think was really valuable. And I think that's why I think poetry is important because you're able to connect with people. You're able to see these, these universal feelings tucked into very specific stories and experiences. Um, the poet Olivia Gowood in her TED Talk, um, um, the TED Talk is called We Find Each Other in the Details. And it's this idea that we're connecting the, through, through poetry, we're connecting the universal to the specific, um, which is another way of saying our our own lived experiences are valuable. And, you know, another thing that she mentioned in the TED talk was that we want to write the poem that saves the world. And we're talking about like these national and these international things. And then by doing that, we don't see our own lived experiences as something worth writing about. Um, but actually the way of like connecting people in the way of, of, of trying to bring people together is by connecting those personal experiences. Um, so, and you should just watch the TED talk, but very briefly, she was talking about how, imagine you're at a pool party. Imagine it's your first time wearing a two-piece swimsuit and you're surrounded by a bunch of girls who've been wearing a bikini since they were like 11. Um, and you know, you are, you're like hugging yourself the whole entire, the whole entire party and, yeah, and so she just painted a picture of how, of a very specific experience in her life. And then she was saying how, yes, this is a personal experience, but we're also talking about girlhood, body image, shame, which are all universal experiences, which are all universal feelings. And so by doing that, we're connecting the personal things to more the political things. And I think that's sort of this, the way of, of how you can approach poetry, connecting the personal to the political um, and finding power in those personal things, finding power in that vulnerability. And that's why I think poetry is important because it finds power and vulnerability and we need more of that in our world. And yeah, and oh yeah. And I just want to shout out my um, English teacher, Miss Rosina, um, a software English teacher who introduced me to this program, the Youth Put Laureate thing. Um, this is the first time Alameda County is doing this. And it was really just really kind of her to, to um, say, hey, Zoe, you should do this. So shout out to all the teachers, all the English teachers, all my English teachers. Miss Waters was my eighth grade English teacher who um, helped us form our poetry unit into the poetry cafe, um, introduced me to spoken word poetry. And just all the teachers and the people who support the arts, um, support writing and just 
give their kid a pencil and a pen or a paper and just be like, here, take this. Um, and yeah, and to so support their kid into whatever outlet they choose. Um, and if that is poetry or rap or music or anything of the arts, just being able to let them express themselves however they, they, they want to. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening to me talk um, for five minutes. But yeah, thank you. All right, snaps for Zoe. I'm gonna hit it twice. All right, before we jump into the broadcast club, uh, I wanna say Zoe is also an amazing student. She's a leader in our marching band, so she, she does it all. Um, I would also like to point out that as a poetry enthusiast, uh, the letters in Torpy are the same as the letters in poetry. Just wanted you to know. Thank you. Uh, before, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fields, will you stand up real quick? I would like to introduce you to the board. Uh, this is Assistant Principal Tracy Fields. Dr. Fields is just a, an amazing partner and team member. Ms. Luna, will you stand up real quick? This is Bridget Luna, Assistant Principal, amazing team member, making everything happen at Cache Valley High School. Our newest team member, Mr. Stephen Hendy. We stole him from the band. Uh, and then what I... And yeah, actually, I'm doing. Uh, and so I would like to introduce Mr. Fortenberry really, quick, really quickly. He's going to talk a little bit about the broadcast club and assistant principal, athletic director, Mr. Fortenberry. Good evening, and thanks for having us, Ms. Amadi, Mr. Howard, other board members. I'm going to let Mr. Jag present. Our broadcast, he's the president of our broadcast club, and he came along today to present for us. Do I push it off? All right, um, just quick introduction. I'm Jag Mishra, I'm a senior at CBHS, I'm club president of the broadcast club, and as you all know, this is Mr. Fortenberry. So you might be asking, what is the broadcast club? The broadcast club is a way for CBHS students to get an up-close experience of what TV production and broadcasting entails. We stream via YouTube Live, um, and through YouTube Live, we have reached viewers all throughout the country. And listed below are some of our statistics. As Mr. Torpy stated earlier, our, our club started originated last year. So these are statistics over the last year and a half. Um, what does the club do? So the club was away during the rough COVID pandemic over the last year and a half for CBHS students and families to experience school of sports and events up close. Um, these events are also posted back on YouTube for students and families to watch. And uh, the, lot, the streams are through the CVHS Athletic YouTube page. Um, what goes into the streams are photography, iMovie, social media, sports, sidelines reporting, announcing, and OBS software. So there's a lot uh, of technical and up close, like, how would I say? Like different, there's different things that go into the streams. There's a lot of different things that go into the stream. Um, so the club is a large club. There's 177 students ranging from uh, freshmen to seniors. The club is advised by Mr. Van Diesel, who's a photography teacher at Castorelli High. And obviously Mr. Fortenberry is one of our advisors. The club has eight total officers. Me, I'm club president. This is my second year in the club. I, Will Akia, who's the original uh, creator of the club, uh, recruited me to join the club last year. And then all of our other officers are first or second year members as well. So Zian is our vice president. Juliana is our secretary. Felipe is the club treasurer. Paulo is the tech coordinator. Ashley Kim, she runs the social media for our club. Sophie Zhang, she does lead graphics. Um, so this is a picture of the club last year. Um, we had 12 total members, 11 were seniors. I was the only underclassman. So I just naturally took the club over. Some goals and objective for this year is to increase our subscriber count. Currently we have 1.3 thousand subscribers. We aim to create as large, we just wanna make it as large as we can. There's no set number for it. Uh, increase viewership as well, and obviously expand the club. Uh, we plan to monetize our YouTube channel over the upcoming weeks. Uh, and with the money that we were raised, we would use it for, that would come back to our club and go into CV athletics. And then most importantly, just to have fun. Uh, to finish, th we're so thankful and glad that you were able to host the broadcast club at this board meeting. And we're excited for this upcoming school year. And on behalf of me and Mr. Fornberry, thank you. Thank you. That is our presentation. Thank you again very much for having us. And I uh, just want to say Jag is an example of a student who, you know, not only does excellent work, he's a student athlete, but is now running a club with 177 students that has brought all of Castro Valley athletics to the community, as well as dodgeball. 
the broadcast club did dodgeball with announcers calling the shots. It was uh, pretty awesome. So thank you very much. Great. Okay, I'd love to have um, Castro Valley High School student Leon. Leon. You know, I'll say quickly, if there's any of you that want to take pictures or movies or whatever, you should feel free to move around wherever, even, be, even behind us to get the best, whatever the best angle is. The governance team, along with Casha Valley High School, are proud to honor Leon Gregorian. Leon Gregorian is a model student and a fantastic human being. His four years at Casha Valley High School have been marked with exceptional levels of engagement and a willingness to learn in a deep and meaningful fashion. This eagerness to engage can be seen when he enters his classes every day prepared and ready to start learning. Even distance learning couldn't stop Leon's dedication to his education and our school. His attendance was excellent. He completed all of his assignments and was very communicative with his teachers. This characterizes Leon as a student and a, and a member of the CVHS community. Leon is joyfully present and engaged in every class period. In the words of Ms. Jervis, Leon's ceramics teacher, academically, he gives his all to do his best work. He asks lots of questions and is good at advocating for himself. Leon is a loving, happy, social person and a joy to have in class. This year, Leon is participating in the Eden Area Regional Occupational Programs Merchandising Pathway. Leon is always on task demonstrating high levels of achievement. He is an enthusiastic learner, asking questions and interacting with everyone around him. Leon is a proud big brother. He is a role model for his siblings and every Trojan. Leon has given his gift to CVHS every day for the last four years, his gift of kindness, warmth, and an open heart. CVHS recognizing Leon Gregorian as a student of the year is just a small way for the school to say thank you. The governance team joins Casha Valley High School in honoring Leon Gregorian as an outstanding student. Congratulations. <laughs> Leon, do you want to introduce your family or any guests that you have here tonight? I like to say thank you to my dad, my mom, Miss Fletcher, my Miss Fletcher and Miss Hefner for coming here tonight. Thank you so much for it. Um, so uh, I get to uh, present the award to the um, volunteer from Castor Valley High, uh, and that is Ivanka Kuchikova. Okay. Um, the governance team, along with Castor Valley High School, are proud to honor Ivanka Kuchikova. Ivanka Kuchikova has been an outstanding parent volunteer 
and partner at Castro Valley High School for both um, specific programs and for the school as a whole. Uh, Ms. Kuchkova is tirelessly given her time to support our students in our school. She is an empathetic member of the community, helping to make connections within and across the parent and school community. Um, Ms. Kuchkova is incredibly dedicated to public education and knows how important the partnership is between schools and families. She's been a member and participant of the Castro Valley High School English Learner Advisory Committee and the CVUSD District English Learner Advisory Committee, the PTSA, as well as a multi-term family representative on the CVHS School Side Council. Wow. Each of these roles requires countless hours and time and attention. The English Learner Advisory Committee the ELAC serves as conduits of information and supports for families of students who are learning English as a second language. They also serve as a forum for both students and families to advise CVHS how we can better serve them. Ms. Kuchikova has been an instrumental part of our ELAC and attended almost every meeting in the four years she has been part of the CVHS community. She has provided valuable feedback to staff, as well as being a resource for other families. Similarly, as a member of the District Advisory Committee, she served as an important bridge in communication, speaking up for the needs of our English learners and their families. She offers her own experience as a language learner and parent, helping our school establish meaningful community relationships. As a member of the CVHA, as CVHS School Site Council, Ms. Kuchikova has been instrumental in fostering the student leadership of that body. She led student-focused discussions, helped guide the development of the single plan for student achievement, and supported the student initiatives that developed from the meetings. Ivanka Kuchikova is a kind, gracious, reflective, and inquisitive, as well as principled individual. Her dedication, honesty, and clarity have helped improve our school. She engages and participates in all that CVHS has to offer, modeling for others the unspoken value of the power of, power of a community in action. CVHS is honored and grateful for continued service to our students. The governance team joins Castor Valley High in honoring Ivanka Kuchikova as an outstanding volunteer. So well deserved. <laughs> so, Ivanka, would you like to say anything, or would you like to introduce anybody who came with you this evening? Um, no, it's just me. Um, it's just honor for me to work with uh, Castor Valley High School. I used to be English learner, and I came twenty years ago with no English and I understand how it's. And it's just honor to work with all the teachers, the principals, the Castor Valley High School is a place to be. And I always love the Castor Valley um, Unified School District. It's just my honor to work. Thank you. Well, thank you. So we'll take a few comments from the board now, if they want to comments or questions for Mr. Torpy and his team. Uh, I'll ask Jennifer first if she wants to say anything. You want to take a shot at your principal here or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds tempting. Torpy is poetry. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed Jag's broadcast club. That's awesome. I did go to a couple meetings um, during the summer, and I think it's just really impressive how you as a the only junior in the broadcast club taking that whole club under your wing after all those seniors left because I was thinking to myself how is this going to work all the officers left will left I don't know how it's going to work but sounds like you you're doing a great job and lots of 
members this year. So that's very impressive. Thank you, Jennifer. Michael? Well, I just want to thank everyone for this extended Trojan time. Um, it's, it's <laughs> it, it, you know, as a newer board member, this is how I get to know who people are. So it's wonderful to have our Trojan community here. I want to congratulate Leon um, and wish him well. Ivanka, congratulations. Um, it, it really resonates with me talking about in English language learners. If you've ever been in an environment where you don't know the language that's surrounding you, I've been one of those people, been in a, a different country. It's it's scary, but it's also it opens an entirely new world. So I just I, I think it's fantastic that how you've contributed to our community in that way. So thank you for that. And to Jag, I have a 10 year old who would love to join your club. I think it's really awesome what you're doing there. Thank you for connecting our high school to Castor Valley into the world. Thank you for being a part of that. And go Trojans. Uh, yes, so uh, this is the the uh, the uh, big school, Castor Valley High. Uh, wonderful. I know my daughter, um, Natalie, oh, um, really enjoyed her time at Castor Valley High, took uh, just about every AP class that she could. One of those was AP Environmental Science, and now I must say she teaches now three periods of AP Environmental Science. So her background at Castor Valley High um, really set her along the way to the path that she's at right now. And um, it is, a, uh, of course, Castor Valley High is the premier high school, of course, in our area. All so lucky to be part of it. Thank you. Hi. Um, considering I have a student at the high school, looking out at all of you administrators makes me feel like I've been called into the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your great presentation. And, and Mr. Logan, I thank you for your presentation um, about the standards-based grading. Um, I am not an educator, but I fight for equity and social justice. And so, um, having a better understanding of what this means um, is great. So thank you. I really appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Superintendent. Yes. I mean, there's just so much to say. First of all, I think the students just were so right on. It was to come back meant they could connect. They felt a sense of belonging. And I really loved seeing the video. I want to thank uh, Mr. Logan Trent you know, the, it's star teachers that we have many, many of who are willing to do things that are different and take a leap and lead. And this is a really important piece for our school district, standard-based grading, grading for equity. It's, it makes sense, but it's, it's something that we really have to work together to understand not just us, but also the parents and students. So I just want to thank you so much for your leadership in that area. And in January, we will have a board workshop where we are going to have you all kind of explain it and kind of get more engaged. But really, it's about what do students knew, know and are able to do? It's have you mastered the standards? And it really reflects the way the li our lives are. In real world, people go to work. They don't get fired the first time they make a mistake, right? They get to try, try and try again. And that's the, the concept. I also, I mean, Zoe, it's incredible. I have watched her video where she actually, the poet laureate video that was on YouTube at least five times. And I will share it at conferences when I'm at because she's incredible, absolutely incredible. She talks about a lot of things that we have been trying to change in education. We had an article that we read, Shelves and Cells, what she was talking about, the lived experiences of people who are reading is so important in connecting with stories. Mirrors and windows. She's just, she should be doing a conference. I also um, obviously know Jack, for, this is like fourth year. I think I've known Jack for four or five years. So just watching him do good. Every single time I talk to Jack, he's got an idea that helps the world. Incredible. Um, 
And of course, Leon, it was so nice to see you up here. Um, I read this morning uh, before we came to the board meeting and I was really looking forward to meeting you and your family. You are an amazing role model, not just for your little siblings, but for everybody else. And Mrs. Kochukova, I actually, she was one of the first parents I met. We were on the Eli committee. She is everywhere and the, one of the most committed people I've ever seen. She never misses a meeting. And of course, last but not least, the, the staff at Castro Valley High School, just, just amazing. Every single place you go, caring people who really work well together. So <clears throat> Mr. Torpy, your entire team of administrators and teachers, I see some of you are sitting in the back, just awesome, awesome people. So I'm just really proud to be a part of this district where we have a high school like that. Thank you. Well, I get to go last, but everybody's already said everything. Um, it's the curse of being last, but I'll make a couple of fast comments. I think the Poet Laureate is really amazing. And you know, the other thing about the Broadcasting Club is it's a great example of the just so many opportunities that students have that are, I don't know that people really realize how great the opportunities are over at that high school. There's just one thing after another over there. It's fabulous. So I have a question though for you, and that is how many other districts are into the grading system that we're talking about here? I don't think it's very many, but do you guys have an idea, anybody? <clears throat> Definitely a few. I mean, I know that the the other based grading books are very popular. They've been read. Uh, and they, we've been involved, like part of the trainings through the Alameda County Office of Education. So it's definitely it's definitely out there. Um, yeah. Well, I I really think that this is one of the most revolutionary things that's happened in our district in a long time. So it's fabulous that we're moving in this. It's the right thing to do. So. Thanks to all of you for that and for all the other things you're doing and for a great presentation tonight. We really appreciate the efforts of everybody. So we'll, did you wanna say something? Some, um, I think you haven't introduced some of your, are there other staff? Yeah, I, I wasn't well, sure. We have, we have Ms. Hefner, wonderful, amazing <laughs> teacher. We have Ms. Fletcher who used to teach with us and we begged her to stay, but she had to go on to other things. You know, <laughs> that's, how, that's how it works. And then Ms. Knowles is back there. She doesn't work with us, but we love her anyway. Uh, <laughs> Great. Thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. You know, we'll take a break here if some of you need to leave, and, but you're very welcome to stick around with us and hear about the superintendent's update and the summer school program and reappointment of our personnel commissioner. So uh, we'll take about a three minute break. So thanks very much.
have to set a timer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You could do that. Okay, we are back. So, uh, do we have a representative of or <laughs> if we, of either one? Okay. We'll get them next time, I'm sure. So we'll move on to public comment. I believe we have one, at least one request. John? Hello? Welcome to our meeting, Bill. Are you out there? Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, hi, my name is Bill Tarolin. I'm the parent of a third grader at Independent Elementary. Uh, I'm commenting tonight just to briefly share a positive start to our Special Education Parent Advisory Committee this term. Uh, we had a really great discussion in our first meeting about enhancing public information to parents as they seek contacts to engage with the SPED department. We also began a crucial discussion about significant improvements in getting committee members directly engaged with site parent communities. We've begun sharing ideas already and we'll be comparing notes with existing groups with well-established engagement with the community like the PACES group at the high school. I'm extremely hopeful that once we have our communities engaged and collaborating, that we can achieve some really positive outcomes. I understand that we're still missing representation from some sites. So if you are a SPED parent hearing this and haven't yet heard about the SPED pack, or been contacted by your site's PAC members, please reach out to Yoko Ostreicher or Dina Cisneros for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your comments. We appreciate them. I will move on to the consent agenda. I'd make a motion that we, we approve it. Thank you, Mike. Is there a second? Uh, yes, I'd like to second that. I just wanted to kind of mention, I don't know where to put this, but um, that the adult ed coursework uh, looks very interesting and very good. I was looking at those, so seconded. <laughs> okay, so moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to the vote. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Mike? Yes. Holly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes. So the consent agenda is approved four to zero. We're on to the reports. Superintendent, I'm looking for. I'm just waiting for the <laughs> presentation. Good. All right. Thank you. Well, first tonight, I want to start in uh, and welcome um, Trustee Aisha Knowles, who is an absolutely wonderful advocate for our students and our community on the Alameda County Board of Education. She's going to share a few things with us. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Superintendent Amadi, executive team members, President Howard, Vice President Theodore, esteemed board members, labor leaders, community members, community advocates, neighbors, and friends. My name is Aisha Knowles. I am your representative on the Alameda County Board of Education. The Alameda County Board of Education is a seven member board. I currently serve as board president and joined the board in 2012. Uh, I just do want to acknowledge sharing space with President Howard tonight. President Howard and I actually participated in the appointment process for the area four seat in 2010. Uh, and guess what? We both tied for first and neither one of us was selected by the board to serve. And fast forward 10 years and, and we're both serving on different boards to continue to serve the community. So I do want to acknowledge. It's really uh, funny. We both came in first and we both lost. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I, you know, it's taken me a few years, number one, to, I think, kind of figure out what I'm doing as a board member. Uh, it's always, you know, it's an ongoing learning process, but this pandemic period of, of uh, daily learning uh, made me think that it, it might be helpful or beneficial to kind of 
visit each of the boards that I am the liaison for on the county board. And so I did present to the San Lorenzo Unified School District Board uh, a couple months ago. I am here tonight to share a couple of updates for the board, uh, and then we'll be attempting to get on the calendar for San Leandro, Dublin, uh, and Hayward to share some updates. So uh, it has been, you know, it's, things have been busy. I see some of you and, and have spoken with you about our weekly calls with the health officer. So Superintendent Monroe, you know, who also is serving as the president of the California Superintendents Association, you know, has been a great partner in uh, working to provide public information about the pandemic for families, districts, school leaders, and community members. Uh, my background is as a, an information officer. Some of you may remember that I worked for the Alameda County Fire Department as the information officer for, for nearly 15 years. And now I work as the information officer for the Fremont Fire Department. I still live in Ashland uh, and you know, am involved in the community. So I have been spending time. So I was reelected as board president for this fiscal year. I served as board president this past year. Uh, you know, some of the highlights, highlights or accomplishments of, of the County Office of Education and the board include holding virtual town hall meetings. I mean, who can remember their first Zoom meeting? I certainly remember mine. Uh, you know, the weekly calls with the health officer uh, and then working on, so my focus on, on a, a very, you know, grassroots level has been working on looking at what access to vaccines uh, community members, students and families have in the unincorporated area, especially, uh, as well as in the rest of, of my district in the county, uh, as well as access to testing. So that has been, you know, a, a passion of mine. I volunteered at a, a number of clinics and, you know, in partnership with Eden Church and, and some of the other community-based organizations. Uh, another thing that I have been, you know, focused on is uh, our youth who are in the juvenile justice system. So fortunately, the enrollment at the juvenile justice center in Camp Sweeney has declined. Uh, however, you may have uh, heard on the news today about two juveniles who were arrested in Fremont. Uh, every time a juvenile is arrested, our student population at the juvenile justice center goes up. So the Former uh, probation chief, Wendy, still retired. And I wanna say someone is in an acting role right now. So that's just something I, I'm keeping an eye on. Um, and certainly when a new probation chief is announced, I'll share that information with you. Uh, the, there are not plans to build a new Camp Sweeney. It was discussed for quite, quite, you know, quite a few years. Um, but the population of youth does not justify building a new Camp Sweeney. And so there are, are other alternative buildings and plans that are, are being discussed. Uh, a few updates from related to the County Office Board of Education that you might hear about. So we received a resolution from the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee recently, who adopted a resolution to uh, encourage our board, the Alameda County Board of Education, to move our election from a primary election to a general election. Their uh, thought process behind this, I believe, was one to have county board members participate in an election when there's a larger voter turnout and when there may be more interest in people running for the position. So this particular resolution was discussed and reviewed by our policy and legislation committee, which contains three board members. It was brought to the full board this past, uh, last week, last Tuesday. And it was the recommendation of the committee to not proceed with changing the board elections from a primary to a general election. So in our next meeting in October, uh, I am working on just connecting with the representatives who share the resolution with us so that they can speak to the full board and or send us uh, information if they would like to continue to pursue it. One of the other things that I should note is that if the election were to change, 
So it first needs to be, a resolution needs to be adopted by the County Board of Education. Then it needs to go to the Alameda County Board of Supervisors. And as a requirement, as part of the uh, change in election, there would need to be a mailer that goes out to all registered voters in Alameda County about the election changing. And the registrar of voters uh, identified a cost of $500,000 as the estimate for what it would cost to send out a mailer to all of the registered voters, voters in the county. So more to come on that. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to mention that you may hear about is this past month, we had some concerned community members who brought forth a concern uh, related to one of the board members, the area seven board member who represents the Tri-Valley area and a part of Fremont and Sunol, uh, not living in their district. So the, uh, there was a request for an item to be placed on the county board agenda to conduct a residency uh, investigation. The matter was discussed in closed session and then at the August 24th meeting and then this past September 14th, the item was discussed in open session. And uh, so the direction of the, from the board after the August 24th meeting was for legal counsel to conduct an investigation. Legal counsel completed their investigation and reported out that the Area 7 representative was able to maintain multiple addresses, including one that is out of state in Oregon. And so there uh, have been, you know, we continue to see, to receive letters from community members. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention in case you uh, are contacted by anyone, you know, they are welcome to contact our board or Superintendent Monroe. That concludes my updates. I, uh, you know, will continue to, to serve and, and, and try and help, you know, to the best of my ability during the, the pandemic. Um, I deliver, so when the pandemic began, I deliver, started delivering meals for Eden Church weekly. So Thursday afternoons are the day that I deliver meals to anywhere between eight to 10 families in South Garden, Hayward Acres, and Cherryland. Um, and, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, I you know, it was, it was heartbreaking because, you know, one thing that has remained consistent throughout all of my weekly deliveries is that I always see the children, you know, the adults might be sick and unable to come help me get the box of food. And, you know, it's all, usually a box and a bag of food. Uh, it's always the kids, kids are always consistent and always, you know, there to, to greet me. And as much as I thought that I have, you know, been the one to help them, I think that that's my weekly dose of, you know, just medicine to, to believe in, in the best in the world. So, um, you know, I, I am here if you have any questions or if you think of any questions in the future, I'm happy to bring them to the board or, um, you know, just wanted to come say hello in person and, and uh, let everyone, you know, know that we, we are, are still, still here, continue to do the work and are here as a resource if you need us. Any questions for Aisha? Go ahead. Uh, no question, but I want to appreciate how much you've pushed um, in the county to um, continue to be transparent about all things COVID and also um, all the work that you've done in promoting vaccination in those communities mm -hmm. that are um, vaccine resistant, um, hesitant, and just working with your heart to educate. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, um, I, I've always appreciated your tenacity for the unincorporated communities, uh, our voice, particularly in early COVID, um, particularly for the more even more vulnerable communities, I think was lost in the beginning. And you were instrumental pushing back on the county on a lot of things. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and just the advocate you've been for Ashland is, is really inspiring and in what you've done throughout the, the, the pandemic. Um, I certainly hope that uh, a cost of $500,000 isn't the basis to sort of consider what the right choice could be, whatever that right choice is determined by the board. 
I've heard that argument made about the cost of sending out mailers for other efforts that we've tried to do in this community to bring more democracy. Um, so I, I certainly hope that projections of cost by the um, by the county it isn't a determinant uh, in terms of how you, how, how you think through that. But thank you again for your service and for being here tonight. Thank you. Uh, yes, I want to thank you, Aisha, very much for all the work that you've been uh, doing and the updates from the ACDCC is, uh, was very interesting, as well as the area at seven that I had heard about. Um, and uh, just to thank, uh, I guess, the Alameda County uh, uh, Board of Education, I did take, I remember, this is a very long time ago, but I did take, uh, I think it was my CLAD classes there. And I remember them being very accommodating because I had a little bitty girl and they let me bring her and she was smearing clay all over the table and I was taking my class and it was just, uh, you know, being that accommodating was really quite wonderful. And uh, I know uh, teachers sometimes take, uh, you know, various different types of classes that are offered there and that's a wonderful offering. And um, uh, I also know about some programs that are run for kids that um, for various reasons can't be in their home districts and there's programs that are, are run by the, the uh, county ed and thank you for all of the, that really hard work that needs to be done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot, Aisha. Thank you. You're always welcome here, so uh, thank you. come back. For sure. I just wanted to make one small comment. I appreciate all of you. You know, I, I don't, I stand here and I am giving you the update, but you know, I don't do this work alone. There are many, many people um, at, at the County Office of Education, on the board, in the community, you know, my, my support network um, that, have, that have helped me get here. And so I, I want to say thank you to all of you for doing the work. You know, so, so many things go you know, unseen, and I don't talk a lot about delivering meals weekly, but, you know, I hope that that puts a human face on, on the pandemic and helping to serve those, especially who are in need in the unincorporated area. So I appreciate all of you, and thank you for letting me report out tonight and visit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so COVID-related topics, um, we're going to cover just a few items. Uh, this is uh, the schedule for our mobile clinic. It's going really well. Um, I just wanted to share with you again that um, we do have that in addition to CFA and we are looking into the antigen testing as well. So there will be more information on that. Positive case dashboard. Parveen, yeah. I just thank you again for the mobile testing. Um, my son was able to use it on Monday and I just, I think normalizing it like that is just really fantastic for the community. And it was so easy for us to give consent for it and the results came back and it, it just, it's making it easier for the community. So thank you for making awesome. that happen. Well, thank you. And I, I think it's because we know that was really a focus for our board. And I wanna thank Ms. Ms. Chan for making that happen. And I'm um, also Dr. Zamora and his team, but um, we're just really glad to have the kind of testing that we have available and different options. So we're very pleased. I'm looking at this dashboard and, and I, honestly, I'm very hopeful. Um, our percentage of cases is much lower than anywhere. And um, in fact, I knock on wood the last few days, we've, you know, we've had one just recently, but uh, basically it's, this, this looks so much better than, um, than I think a lot of uh, instances. And I have to say, they're the main reason for all of this. There are two reasons. One is our families have done a fantastic job following all the guidelines and really paying attention to what's going on and, and to use the screener and not sending their children home to school when they have any symptoms. So we have very low rate of positive COVID in Castro Valley Unified School District. And this is the piece that makes me really happy. We have not had school transmission within the district. We have had COVID cases, but they haven't been transmitted because somebody, because again, families have done a great job, the excellent cooperation that we've had from students 
for following directions, putting their masks on, doing everything they're supposed to do, testing, and our staff, our teachers and staff at the schools and families. Vaccination rates continue to increase in the county. In, in Castro Valley, at least one dose with 93.5% recently. And then two doses, we already have 79.1%. That is very encouraging. Our employees, 91% of our employees have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, 98% of our certificated. So I, I just wanted to share my gratitude um, to all the hard work that goes on behind the scene. I, I think for every case that happens, there is there are hours and hours of checking, contact tracing, making sure everything goes well. And that's really why we've been able to do what we've been able to do. So, um, and then we're closely following all of the guidelines and requirements by Alameda County Department of Public Health. It, it has been really uh, wonderful to have that connection and to be working with them um, very closely on all of this. So what's next? Um, we're hearing that COVID-19 vaccine um, is expected to be available for five to 11 year olds soon. We'll continue to set up vaccination clinics and do as much as we can to encourage everybody. I think that's our goal to continue to encourage vaccination, especially when the younger um, students are able to get vaccinated. We're gonna, uh, we are also going to continue to monitor cases um, and work closely with Alameda um, Department of Public Health. Other district updates, uh, naming committee update, if um, actually Trustee Theodore is gonna share with us. Thank you. Um, so Dolly and I have put together, you know, that um, uh, application um, that we had forwarded to you. And in, in that process, um, we are also going to add a former student and current student as part of the uh, categories of people we would like to solicit input from. And it was sort of my misunderstanding of the purpose of the committee. I was thinking this would be a standing committee that would gather every time this came up, but we're really, we're going to focus on the, the case that has, or the, the family that has come to us to ask for us to honor their um, family member. And I think that's the way we should proceed is on a case by case basis. And we have now this structure and this form that we can ask people to apply and um, to solicit a wide range of uh, community members to have some input. One of the things that we talked about is not having such a huge committee that it becomes too squirrely, but to also be diverse about um, the people who are on it. So with the amount of people who are within the district that are on it, um, we're hoping to have maybe five or six community members that fit into these categories so that not everybody is from athletics or not everybody is from art. Um, so we'll move, move forward with putting out this um, interest form for people who might want to participate on the naming committee and then we'll figure out when we can convene mm -hmm. and, and do this. Yeah. Um, and then the one other um, update I wanted to give, I wanted to really um, share my appreciation um, with our, in our partnership with Sutter has been really wonderful. The last two years, they have three years, they have supported us with funding. This is an additional funding that they have uh, actually, um, we've, uh, they have given us for $65,000. And this is really exciting because it's in partnership with Hear, um, Hear You, Dot org for providing telehealth, remote mental health therapy to students throughout the district. And this is really great because it actually is online. Um, we, um, they work with the wellness center to make sure that the right um, students are connected with the program. And it's a pilot and um, it, they actually have covered the cost $65,000. So really grateful uh, to Sutter. How many students are accessing that service? So at first we were talking about a thousand students. 
Um, so, and they, they are going to start with groups um, of students that they, that we would, I, you know, identify through the wellness center and through the different programs at the different schools and then uh, work with them. They're still working on all the logistics, but it's pretty exciting. I wanted to share that and, and share our um, gratitude as well. I think that's my presentation. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the summer school program presentation. Take that. Yes, we're excited uh, to have our team here. <laughs> and Dr. Ryman is gonna introduce this. <clears throat> Just very briefly as a reminder, <clears throat> this year's summer school was an expanded program um, and where we saw an expansion of uh, the, the elementary program doubling in size, also the secondary program adding uh, additional layers of support, uh, including the addition of resource specialist teachers during the summer programs, and um, as well as the ESY program uh, doing a great job in presenting some information. So tonight we're fortunate to have a few of our principals at elementary ESY, uh, and also Ms. Peritor and Ms. Rashishi here to present tonight. Oh, and Ms. O'Stryker, who was called out earlier for doing an excellent job on the Parent Advisory Committee. Uh, yes, good evening, board members and cabinet members and stakeholders in the audience. We are really excited to be here tonight. Um, I'm Mia Rashichi, Director of Elementary Education. I'm gonna start us off, but we, have, we do have a whole team of Dr. Ryman just said um, here to present to you tonight. So um, just some overall information um, we, for our summer program, we had some smaller class sizes. We were so thankful to continue to have our in-person instruction and additional supports for English learners and then some additional staff, which really made some difference this year with our resource specialists and counselors. And we really appreciated that additional staff. It helped out a lot with both students and the staff. Um, for at the elementary level, very specifically, we grew um, from one site that we've had in the past to three sites. And we know we want to be able to serve all of our students across the district. And so that, that was very helpful. And of course, we'll talk about our secondary um, uh, programs and the work that we did there. So that's kind of like just a nutshell slide. So elementary, um, accelerating learning one day at a time. And that's exactly what we think we did. Um, a couple of reminders for the board and for our audience, our summer school program at elementary, we've served our first through fourth grade students. We had 19 days of instruction, which isn't a lot of time, but we certainly made the most of it. And then also we had our kind of dual leaders. We are really big dual believers in developing capacity and a pipeline, a leadership pipeline. And so we paired new principals or new leaders with some of our seasoned veteran principals. And that really does help us to kind of like develop the next leaders um, for our school district. So we're really happy with that model and we'll continue that model into future summer schools. So what was taught? We focused on English language arts, mathematics, English language development, and of course we incorporated some organizational skills that are part of our AVID strategies. And so we think we had a pretty robust program and I know that you all are very interested in, so what is the data say? So I'm gonna hand off to my colleague, one of our leaders, Ms. Elizabeth Contreras, and she's gonna to talk to you about our elementary data. Ms. Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Mia. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us today and allowing us to present. So first, I want to just go over this slide here that shows what we used as our assessment to gather our data. So we want to have meaningful pre-data to see where our students are and then our post-data afterwards to see how effective our program was. So on the next few slides, you'll see our, our data in action. The blue is showing students who were meeting data and the red is showing students who were below expectations at the time of assessment. The assessments we used were in ELA and math, and then we disaggregated that data to show how we were, how we were closing gaps with our English learners. For ELA, we assessed the student's ability in phonics. So what we have found through our RTI programs throughout the district, and for those of you who don't know, I should have introduced myself, I'm the RTI specialist at CVE. That is my normal job. And I served as co-principal with Afi Skloot at CVE for summer school. 
So what we have found through our RTI program is our students who are at risk of not meeting standards in reading, much of what they struggle with is their ability to decode. In other words, their phonics skills. So we used our phonics screener for intervention to assess where the students were at in their decoding abilities and to ascertain where their, where their gaps were, where their foundational skills had gaps. For our math assessment, we used a district created math screener that was made by Sharon Friedman, our former math consultant. And she put that together based on the Common Core math standards. And then, like I said earlier, we disaggregated that data to see how effective our program was for our English learners. All right, so here's our data. For first grade, this is our, our phonics data from our, our ELA data. So for our first graders, they came in 36% proficient and they left at 77% proficient. So we saw, we saw a great increase there, 41% in proficiency over the 19 days of instruction. For our second graders, they came in at 44% proficient and left at 72% proficient. So that was a 28% increase in their ability to decode words at grade level. So a lot to celebrate in our data and some key learnings that we'll also talk about later. For our upper grade students, our third graders came in with 26% proficiency, left at 47% proficiency for a 21% increase. And fourth grade came in at 37 and left at 65% proficient for a 28% increase in their ability to decode grade level phonics. Our math data. So here's our primary math data for first grade, again, using our math screener. Students came in 20% proficient in first grade and left 60% proficient for a 40% increase in their ability to perform at grade level. Our second graders came in at 2% proficient and left at 14% proficient. So 12% growth there. Third graders came in at 6% proficient, left at 43%. So we have a 37% increase there. And our fourth graders came in at 37 and left at 65% proficiency for a 28% increase. And here's how our disaggregated data looked. So our first grade English learners came in with phonics skills showing 36% proficiency and they left with 64% proficiency. So they had, they had gains there also, uh, a slightly smaller gain than all of our students in first grade. Our second grade English learners came in with 18% proficiency and left with 55%. So they had a slightly larger gain than our overall population in summer school. Third graders, 17 to 38, an equivalent gain for our third graders. And our fourth graders, 23 to 62, which was an 11% increase for our overall student population in summer school. So that was exciting growth that we saw made there. And for our math, our first grade pre-data for our English learners, 29% proficiency level, increased to 82% proficiency, which is a 13% gain over the overall student population. So that was very exciting. Our second graders, 6% to 21%. So they, they grew 15%, which was 3% over our overall student population. And third grade came in with students all below grade level, not meeting expectations, and left with 67% of our English learners meeting expectations based on the math screener in third grade. So that was very exciting. That's a 67% increase and 30% increase over our overall increase for all our student population. Fourth grade, 7% to 31%, which was a 24% increase and slightly lower, lower than our overall student population. So lots to celebrate and lots to learn from as we proceed with the future of our summer school program and our instructional programs district-wide at the elementary level. So I'm gonna pass it off now to my colleague, Lisa McLean, and she'll go over some of our um, qualitative data that we collected. All right, so good evening. My name is Lisa McLean, and I am uh, by day a principal at Jensen in summer. I've had just an amazing time being able to serve up at Independent. Um, with Sarah Winding, who was principal last year at Chabot. Um, so getting feedback uh, formally and informally is really important. Um, and it helps us to know if uh, not only we saw the, the actual like hard data from a student assessment, but the people who had boots on the ground, how were they feeling about the work that they were doing, the materials that they had access to um, in families, how were they feeling about 
um, actually sending their kids to the summer program and the value of that program overall. So just kind of taking you through um, just with our staff, what they had to share. I mean, this is, we had lots of comments, but just to give you a snippet, really they were very appreciative of the type of curriculum that we put together. We spent a lot of time, it was really nice having a strong um, elementary team to do the planning, the pre-planning in the spring, along with working with, with uh, Nia, because we really thought about what happened last year, the learning loss that took place, but where we wanted our students to be able to start out as we began this school year and what needed to happen in between, what bridges did we need to make? So selecting the curriculum was very, very important. And so our teachers were very appreciative of the curriculum that was selected and all the additional resources that were put together to help make their time successful with the students. They weren't having to prepare and find things. Everything was pre-prepped and ready for them. Smaller groups, um, you've heard that before. Um, it is. It was amazing to have small class sizes and the teachers were really appreciative of that because it really allowed them to target their lessons and really work on those essential skills. The phonics material and the guide that went along with that, all of that prep really helped the teachers. They were appreciative of that as well as the guided reading material. Um, the extra set of weeks that we had just to be able to have our kids in person. We had such a short spring with our kiddos. Um, you know, on, you know, in the classrooms. And so to be able to get five additional weeks with them in the summertime, as you can see from the data that Elizabeth shared, was instrumental in helping those kids walk in the door this August with much more confidence. Um, and then the EL piece was very important to us to figure out how we were going to embed that into our day. Um, and we were, the, the teachers were very pleased with how we set it up, which was basically at the end of the instructional day for everybody, we embedded that in that all of our EL kids would have a designated time to get additional services. So how about our families? All right, um, and they again, you'll see words like confidence, you know, being able to uh, feel comfortable in being able to do their schoolwork, mastering times tables um, and having pride in what they were doing. Um, just great organization, having great teachers and staff, um, feeling safe. Safety is a big piece that our families felt trust in us to create a program where their children who were unvaccinated were going to be safe. Um, obviously, we had COVID restrictions because those were those are necessary during these times. Um, and so we weren't allowed to have parents on campus. Um, so that was something that, you know, obviously was a missing piece, having that, you know, at the door connection with families. Um, so those are things to think about. Hopefully we won't be in that situation next summer, but if we are, how can we make some changes to increase uh, homeschool uh, communication and involvement with families? Positive learning environment uh, where students worked on items as a refresher. Um, and they, again, families really appreciating those small class sizes and the assistance that they received. So, it was, that was not only just what we heard through the surveys, but also just at pickups and drop-offs every morning, families were very gracious, kids were happy and smiling. They were so excited to be in person and meeting new friends and greeting old friends. And finally, what's next? So obviously there are things that we did during the summer that are gonna help us in, do, in our thinking and planning for this school year, as well as in the future for summer school. So we tried some new some, some programs for ELA and how can we then continue to utilize those things in the school year? So being able to pilot some of those things in the summer and then continue in the school year. Um, some additional things that came out of this support was we were able to um, enhance our math teaching and learning. So we've hired a new TOSA to support mathematics, to support professional development, model lessons, data analysis, analysis and curriculum instruction. Um, that started off with a math survey that went to the teachers to get input from them. What do they need? Um, and then being able to implement this year the idea of um, the interim assessment benchmarks, the IABs, to help us inform our mathematics instruction along the way. Um, and finally, to augment our services to, to our English learners, super excited about this one, having a TOSA who's gonna support the ELA and ELD to strengthen our EL support for our students through 
uh, PD to our teachers, to our administrators, such as myself, and support staff, including model lessening. Model lessening. So summer provided us a great opportunity to learn, um, and it kept us thinking and planning about the work that we need to, needed to do. Um, and I'm so grateful that we had such a, a nice, solid team um, of educators to work with because more people together um, allowed us to really expand what we wanted to do. So thank you. Be, uh, as, as you're getting uh, ready to go to the next one, I think it's really important when we look at the data to remember, these are students who are identified as students who were not on grade level. So um, just, and, and we know distance learning was not easy. And as you've noticed, math is a lot harder to do distance learning versus in person because it's so different. That, that's an excellent point. And <clears throat> those data points that were shared those were the students who made it from being below grade level to making grade level. So of the students that didn't make it to grade level, lots of them also showed increases uh, in, in their skills and increases in their performance, but didn't necessarily make it all the way up. So it's actually really, really impressive data that we got. Hey everyone, I'm Liz McCarthy. I uh, was the special education ESY principal for the summer. We also followed the same hours and dates as the elementary, which was June 7th to, to July 8th. And happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so I wanna tell you, we had um, ESY sites everywhere. We had two little groups in Alma, one at independent for preschool. We had six classes at the elementary. Um, four classes at the high school, which included middle through high school. And then the transition program was quite large up at Redwood and the counseling and rich class was there as well. Um, so the, the purpose of extended school year is quite different from, you know, the intervention summer school that we had. And really what it's about is providing continued instruction for students whose data shows regression. And so what we do often is we look at how kids are after a long break and if they seem to not be reading at the same level or having difficulty kind of remembering where they were or where they're at, we kind of take, take data on that and, and get them the services for extended school year. Um, so the student data shows a regression and difficulty with recruitment skills. Not only did they have a hard time, you know, we all do after the winter break, but really they took an extra couple of weeks to get those skills back. So we wanna make sure we can give them the extra support in the summer. Um, next. So, oh, great. So just for you to know, um, students have to qualify, obviously, for ESY, because we look at that data if they had some regression and recoupment. So of all of our students, only just about 18%, it is recommended. And of that 18%, we had 56% um, of them attend ESY. We had a total of 163 students that qualified 92 attended. I think there was still a little bit of fear about coming back. And then we always kind of have the difficulty with, that was when things were opening up and I think people wanted to get out of town. Um, so our curriculum mostly included the CBUSD curriculum, Fountas and Pinnell, we had RAS kids. We always use Eureka Math, but the SDC teachers often have to supplement with materials We've had IXL, which is a personalized computer-based curriculum. We've had it for two or three years now. Um, it aligns with state standards, and then teachers can actually go in and, and target kids' IEP goals. That's always been really helpful. And then, of course, every special ed teacher is always creating their own materials in kids' goal areas. Um, we were also able to have a speech and language pathology services um, that person joined us a little bit late and then was able to stay on and provide um, more speech therapy after ESY was over for a good two weeks. He stayed on and worked with individuals and small groups. We had targeted behavioral supports and then the um, big kids, the high schoolers, 16 and above had some transition support. And at the end, of course, we, all the teachers reported on progress on students' goals. And the highlights, you know, I think 
we all felt this way over the summer is that it was a great time to facilitate the social language and social skills after you know distance learning and students were able to play together i mean it was just wonderful watching them play tag and talk and and even though they had their their masks on it was sheer joy um, we had a really committed, dedicated staff who were familiar with students. Almost all the, the teachers were our special ed teachers, all the paras, and they often got to stay with their class. And so they really knew the kids. That was really fabulous. It was very activity based. You know, they didn't feel with that hybrid, we could have time for science labs and art and hands on activities. So there was a lot of that. Um, the high school did a lot of cross um, cross class collaborations. They would get together. The middle school class would get together with the high school class and and do activities. Um, they all did PE together. That was hysterical. Uh, oh, that's not me. It, I'm going to give it to Vivian. Thank you. I just got so excited. <laughs> Return. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, board. Um, our secondary program was largely increased this year, and we offered many different types of offerings for our secondary students. We have not been able to offer middle school, summer school before uh, for quite some time, and we had um, 144 students entering for the middle school program. And you can see the numbers. We had a total of 603 students, which did not include the extension of our CDBA courses, which was another 48 students on top of that. So that was quite a lot of students for summer school. Um, for math, we used the MDTP, which is the um, mathematics development um, testing uh, program which we've been using for a long time. Typically we give it at the beginning of the school year to see if our students are ready for the next grade level or for the grade level they're entering into math. So there's a pre-algebra test, a calculus, you know, et cetera. Um, they had already taken that um, at the end of the school year um, to compare the data from the beginning to the end of the school year. So we use that thing as they had already just taken it. And then we use the same local assessment for middle school that we've been using for summer school um, for several years. So here's the average growth of our middle school students in summer school for math. So um, it is uh, an 8% growth for the math one course, 10% uh, growth for the math seven course, and a 5% growth for the math eight course. Then again, um, for the language arts, um, it was um, a 1% growth for the um, sixth grade, um, a half percent growth for the seventh grade, uh, almost a 1% growth for the eighth grade. And then for our English language learners, they made a little bit more growth, which is 1.1%. I would like to point out that it's 19 days and that growth is harder to come by the older the students are. Um, so, so the really great data is from our high school program. We had 546 courses taken, even though uh, we have fewer students than that in a regular high school because some of them took two classes. Um, out of those, you can see that out of 546, only 35 students scored an F again. So that is a, a really high percentage rate of students who, who would have gotten no credits on their transcript who now have credits on their transcript, which is really important for graduation, of course. Um, and here's that same data in a graph, which shows that the number of students who came in with an F, um, who came in with uh, an F and then ended with an F was only 6.75% of our students. Um, of course, some students had a little trouble attending, and so that is really what accounted for our 6.75. But if you, if you look at the other grades, um, a lot of students did really well in the secondary classes in summer school. We also, in our middle school, had something new, 
uh, apart from the fact that middle school itself was new, we also had in our English language arts classes, we had um, Freedom Soul Media Education Initiatives. Um, the uh, the uh, director and uh, leader of that is uh, Tyson Amir, who you've probably heard of in many situations. He had um, his teachers come and co-teach with our teachers. So part of the class was a self-expression in writing taught by Tyson and Mia's teachers with our teachers in the room, of course. And then the other part was our teachers teaching some basic language skills to our students um, after the assessment, seeing what they really needed and being able to target that. So here's a couple of pictures. Um, this is Tyson and Mia's group of teachers on the left-hand side. And this is um, Mr. McMurray with um, his group of students on the right-hand side. And here's an example of uh, um, an older student's work. This is something they produced during summer school. There's such beautiful poems. I was reading yes. them at the... Yeah, we actually had a poetry display where we put the yeah. poems up on a board and people could come see them. Um, and um, the students were really proud of their work. Um, I was privileged to be able to go into summer school many times. Um, and I didn't ever see a single student with a mask off. Everybody was focused and engaged in every classroom I walked into. And the students, um, of course, I knew some of them because they were Chabot students in the past, were extremely proud to show me what they had written and the work that they had done. And uh, the next poem is by a sixth grader. They did um, some I am poems in sixth grade about their identity. But they're so poignant. If you read these poems, they'll bring tears to your eyes, some of them, because they talk about, they're so honest and talk about their worries and their pride and who they believe they are. And um, it's really hard not to get involved in the poems when you read them. So our students had a really hard time this last year and a half. And so this um, enrichment opportunity we were able to offer them was allowed them to express all of that, um, the joys that they felt and also the sorrows that they felt. And so that's really important. And that's of course, one of the uh, greatest things about writing and being able to express yourself in writing is that you can, you can say things that you might not normally want to say. And finally, I uh, want to outline that we had many different programs We've never had this many programs in summer school before. We've had many different programs to fit the many different and diverse needs of our students. And um, we, we felt like there was a lot of positivity in our summer school program. Thank you very much. I think I'm opening up to questions for Dr. Ryman. Any questions? Any questions? Mike? So, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, thank you for, for well, thank you for the presentations tonight. Um, if we lived in a world where money was available, would we have a different vision of what summer school looks like going forward based on our experience this past summer? That's a really open-ended question. I appreciate that. So I'll, I'll give a more concrete response and open-ended answer. Um, thanks to some uh, really strategic budgeting on the part of Ms. Chan. Um, we do have sufficient funding to continue at least for this coming summer, all of the programs, and we plan to actually uh, enrich uh, the programs and make, make them stronger based on uh, the lessons that we've learned. Uh, we're really satisfied with the work that we did in the breadth in terms of the number of students that we were able to bring in. Um, one of the things we are talking about is you know, how we can maybe embed some of those enrichment activities, especially at the younger grades. Um, but the, the writing program especially was very successful at both the elementary and secondary levels. So we're also looking at ways not just to sustain, but also to grow. Um, our hope is that some of this one-time funding that we've gotten 
will continue in the out years. So we're trying to be strategic about budgeting things so that uh, funds that can carry over into the out years will hopefully help us to sustain it beyond not only uh, this coming summer, but hopefully at least for a, another summer or two uh, beyond. All right, two more questions. Um, do we have a sense just, I know this is just one experience from the summer and now we're six weeks into the school year. Does, does this give us an indicator of the overall state of learning loss um, within the district and how we are doing and tackling it? Uh, we can, it, it's impossible to overstate the impact of learning loss. In fact, uh, even now there's ongoing um, uh, impact from COVID-19. Um, whether we're talking about the social emotional impact to families, uh, students, we're seeing that in terms of uh, classroom behaviors and behaviors at school, uh, study skills. Uh, we are also seeing in terms of academic performance. Um, so we are trying to dig out, but some of the logistical limitations are just as simple as, as if you're a student who's come into close contact and dealing with the COVID protocols. Those pieces alone have an impact on learning. So all of these pieces are difficult. I think that we're uh, doing the best um, that we can. We're in a district, fortunately, where we're looked at as being one of the leading districts in the county in terms of being innovative and finding uh, successful strategies to address the most that we can. However, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, it wouldn't be an honest statement to say that the impact has been totally mitigated at this point. It's something that I think is going to continue on in terms of us having to address it uh, for the next few years. I just to add, I think this is why the legislators really knew we have got to and the governor knew we have to open schools because no matter how innovative we wanted to be during distance learning, there was a lot going on at home, parents had to work, help their kids. And the impact isn't gonna, it's gonna be here for us uh, for a while, which is why the state actually, um, if you look at the dashboard, the data that they're using, they're actually going back in like a couple of years and not this year, because it'll take time. It will take a lot of time. But I, I have to say, the reason that we were able to do all of this is because one time money that we were given for these purposes. So this is an opportunity every district had, and we actually really wanted to make sure that we use the money for what it's intended for. I just have one small comment and just one question of clarification for Mrs. Peritor. Um, I really appreciate the distinction between what the intervention means for elementary versus secondary and the impact, but not an educator here, right? So learning about that and hearing that is, is helpful for me. Um, the chart on the grades, like what the grade was before versus what what it was, I, I noticed like, I think one of the, the there seemed to be some, uh, some where someone maybe had a B before and I'm like, why are they in summer school? I, I, maybe I misread the chart um, in, in that moment. So maybe if you could just sort of talk about what gets you into summer school and uh, is it just based on grades or is it, are there some other assessments that are made for students, notwithstanding grades? So, um... You're referring to this chart. You'll notice that um, <laughs> it's zero percent got a B and zero percent got an A. Or zero point one nine percent Zero. Sorry, I should put my glasses on before it. That oh, I got a B. Sorry, a pass. Zero point one. That represents a very small number of students, but um, those students may have wanted to retake to get an A. And, you know, we we do obviously concentrate, as you can see, on students who get an F or a, a D, because on their transcript, of course, that really makes a big difference, because these are A to G. So the um, this summer school program that we're looking at right here, these are A to G classes still. So it's not credit recovery. We had credit recovery as well, but most of these are actually, they, they replaced um, an A to G class on their transcript. So there are a few students who would want to replace a B with an A, very few. 
and we don't usually allow too many of them into summer school, but we were able to accommodate them this year. You know, things are clarifying because I, my understanding was for elementary, it was sort of invite only looking at very specific criteria. It seems like grades trigger it for, for secondary, mm -hmm. but maybe there's other conversations that lead to someone being enrolled to summer school. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Dolly. Uh, not questions, but just a comment. Uh, uh, thank you all so much, really, for uh, working the summer school program and for having those extra students and using uh, data to track them, the elementary data and the secondary data, really amazing. And um, uh, my, my old counseling and rich class, I see it there, of course, in there. Uh, I didn't actually teach it during the summer, but I know many of my kids would go to summer school and it um, was really good for them, for keeping them um, focused on their uh, grades and academics and uh, their social emotional uh, needs as well. So great job. Thank you all. I can't remember who it was that opened the conversation with saying that we want to see the data and we really do. And I really appreciate all of the graphs and the time putting put into making this really clear presentation to us. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you for being the administrators in this wonderful program and then showing us the data. Well, you know, I actually visited most of the classrooms at the summer school. So I got to see a lot of this firsthand with some of you, in fact, uh, not all of you, but some of you. Um, and I was impressed by the, uh, the work that was going on in the classroom, the attitude of the students and the staff and the morale of the students and staff. They were all happy in particular in the uh, high school math classes, which tend to be the, you know, <laughs> psychological graveyard of, uh, of summer school. But this year they were different. I mean, I noticed a real difference this year, whereas in the past, some of the kids were sort of, you know, eyes were wandering around the room and uh, they were face down in their desk occasionally. They were actually all engaged this year. And that made me, I was really impressed by that because that's different and I know COVID was a big thing and so we had a lot of trouble this year with grades and uh, but we still have as you said 459 students out of 3,000 who could manage to get a D or an F in a required class that's 15 percent of the high school wound up with a D or an F so I know COVID is a problem, but uh, our goal long-term up here has been to reduce the need for summer school. So um, I like what was going on in math and COVID certainly didn't help us. I think we're on the right track, but we still got a little bit of a ways to go. Um, and the thing that always gets me is we do better in summer school than we do in the regular year. And I wonder whether we should reverse our teaching or something. Um, <laughs> because we have a lot of kids getting a very good grade in summer school that, um, so somehow is there something we can learn from summer school to translate into the regular school year uh, to enable these kids so that they don't need to go to summer school for credit recovery or whatever, and we can turn it into an enrichment summer rather than uh, a forced march through the class that they flunked in the regular school year. So, but thanks for all your efforts. I don't mean to be negative on this. I just uh, think that, you know, we need a cold look at the data um, and to be happy about the good elements of it and still con somewhat concerned about where we are with all of this. But as I say, I saw it firsthand and it looked great. So I do appreciate all of that. And I appreciate the presentation that you guys made tonight. <laughs> I think President Howard, you raise an excellent point in terms of the outcomes from summer school. Um, and you know, one thing, every student who's in summer school for at the high school level has already taken the course. So they've seen all of the information at least one time. That said, <clears throat> I think that connects to our equity and grading uh, program where it's not, so our current grading past practice had been you need to know this material on this date. 
But I think one thing that summer school shows is if given a little bit more time or yeah. if you're retaught some of the information yeah. and you're given an opportunity. To it is the second in. time they've seen it, too, yeah. in a sense. They saw it in the regular school year and now they're seeing it again. So that's good. I mean, all of us do better the second time. Exactly. And, and that's part of the uh, more restorative grading practices, equitable grading practices, is the idea that if you fail a test, rather than waiting for summer school to retake it, you could fail the test, you'd be compelled then to come back and be retaught some of the material, mm -hmm. and then be given an, a second opportunity to take the exam again. So I think that's not the total solution, but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Right. I think we're doing we're doing way better on this, believe me. I mean, I've been around for a few years now, and this is uh, yeah, I, that the standard based grading is really why yeah. it's so important to focus on because basically, there are things that we have done forever for hundreds of years yeah. that we know do not work. They make absolutely no sense. Averaging grades do not make sense. And yet it's done everywhere. Yeah. If a student, right, if, it, if I'm running, if I'm a track star and I have a com competition, they're not going to average from when I started. It's where I finished. Did I get the standard? Did I meet that standard? So this is why I'm really excited about that. Um, I also want to say, I, I think being, I, I really want to give lots of kudos to this team who's sitting here and the rest of them who, were summer school. They planned for months to make sure we have lots of options for kids. And I think what you noticed, I also noticed, is students seem to be a lot more like engaged during summer school. Yeah. Because I think they were they were starving to be in an organized <laughs> in a in person. They saw the impact and they were just happy to be there. Yeah, I think that's true for sure. So our kids have learned so much. So thank you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Great presentation. So our next item is a public hearing. Hearing This is an annual event on the assurance that we have enough instructional materials. So I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any requests online to speak? We don't. Any in the room? Nope. I'll close the public hearing. And we'll move on to item D, which is to adopt a resolution or to consider resolution 11-2122 on the same topic. Sure. <laughs> so thank you, President Howard. As you mentioned before, uh, on an annual basis, we certify the sufficiency of textbooks. These are the core instructional materials in every classroom uh, in Castro Valley Unified School District. Each year, principals work with their teachers to ensure that they have all of their materials uh, and then we take that information and, and verify that, that we've gotten that certification. Uh, every school site has stated that they have all of their instructional materials. Uh, so we do recommend to the board uh, to, to approve. I just wanna thank staff for explaining this to me and I would make a motion that we approve this. I uh, second that. There was a second? Yes. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mike? Yes. Holly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll vote yes. So the resolution is adopted four to zero. So we have now another, well, not an annual event, but a periodic event, the intent to reappoint the personal commissioner. You know, and I think a lot of people may not really understand the personal commission. And the, I was wondering if you or or Dr. Zamora might want to say uh, just a briefly review, maybe for the people online who might not understand what we're doing on this. So the intent of the reappointment is to, one, for the personnel commission, where there's a personnel commission of three, and each term they have to get reappointed. And one of the unique pieces for Castro Valley we're one of the few districts that actually the state superintendent of public instruction appoints our commissioners. Not everyone gets the opportunity to have that honor, I would call it. And so this was stems back from 1965. The role of the personnel commission is really to make sure that the process of hiring 
And the testing is an equitable system across the district. And that's the main goal is to make sure that equitable piece uh, is developed throughout the district and that everyone has a fair chance to test and then apply as part of the process. So this is one of the two steps that will come forward to the board. The one is to make a plug-in announcement for the intent to reappoint, and then we'll come back. We have a timeline to come back in October then to actually appoint Commissioner Bailey. At that time, Commissioner Bailey will also give the personnel commission report, which will provide a length or more in-depth information about the personnel commission work and what they do in the, throughout the school year. Okay, this is an action item. I'll move uh, to approve the intent to reappoint. Thank you. I'll second that. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I will mention that I spoke to Commissioner Bailey the other day in person, and uh, he appreciates being on the commission and is looking forward and hoping to be reappointed. So we'll start the vote here. Uh, Michael? Yes. Dolly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes. So we will, uh, we've approved our intent to uh, reappoint uh, Commissioner Terry Bailey for another term on the boards. So that's terrific. Thanks very much. We're down to item F, the uh, personnel report. So the Human Resource Department has just worked on the certificate and classified employment uh, and the process for the hiring piece of or the, the employees, sorry. And so we're just bringing forward the report for approval for the board. I move to approve the personnel report. Thank you. All seconded. Thank you, Mike. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, we'll go to the vote. Mike? Yes. Dolly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes. So the personnel report is approved four to zero. We're down to the certificated substitute rate. So we performed a study to look where Castro Valley falls within Alameda County, and we are finding a shortage in our substitute pool, but this is not necessarily just Castro Valley, it is county and statewide. But in order to be competitive and to make sure that we have the consistency of instruction to continue, we wanna make sure that we're also competitive in Castro Valley and within the Alameda County. So before the board are two options for the board to vote on to see where we would like to move forward and to hopefully fill in these shortages that we have in Castro Valley. So the first option is the one to 20 days at $175 with 20 or more days at $200. The second, the second option is one to 20 days to 180 and 20 or more to $205. You see the, the cost breakdown of what that would cost between the two different options. This would definitely help, again, like I mentioned, to continue the, the instruction consistency so that we do have subs that do love to uh, be here in Castro Valley and keep them loyal to our district, as well as attract others. Are there any thoughts on this, Dolly? Um, I would go for the second option to be even closer to uh, what the other surrounding districts are paying for substitute like, teachers. I mean, option two does sound better to me, but I think uh, there are districts out there that are paying more. So why is it in our interest maybe to go lower than maybe some other surrounding districts? What would option two, for example, where would that put us um, as compared to other districts around us? So that really places a right just above the middle tier of what we're looking at. There are uh, probably two districts that are just a bit higher and then there's one district that is outrageously high um, that are, aren't playing nice in the sandbox, I would call it. Yeah. So I think this would place us in a really good position, Alameda County wide, yeah. Option two sounds good. Okay, this is... Does anybody want to make a motion here, please? I'll make a motion that we accept uh, the uh, option two for the substitute rate increase. I'll second that. Okay, so moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, we'll go to the vote. Mike? Yes. Dolly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes, so we'll go with that one. 
Thank you, Thank you for preparing those, uh, Ramon. Uh, okay, down to item H, which is a resolution to excuse Trustee Whitaker for her absence at our first meeting this month. I would do. Oh. <laughs> I'll move that we adopt this resolution. One more. I'll second it. Thank you. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to the vote. Mike? Yes. Dolly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes. So that is the resolution is adopted four to zero. Finally, is to adopt the minutes of the board meeting in the first meeting in September. Uh, I move that we adopt the minutes uh, from the board meeting on September 8th. Second from Dot, thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to the vote. Mike? Yes. Ali? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes, so it's four to zero. We've adopted the minutes of that meeting. We're down to the superintendent's report. Just really quickly, we had our parent leadership council. Um, I also attended the uh, DLI um, committee last night. It was wonderful. Thank you. I know uh, Trustee Howard, uh, President Howard was there as well. This is the dual language immersion committee, kind of looking at that. And then I was at Stanton's PTA. I've also been visiting schools. So I was at Stanton Adult School in Redwood already. So just some of the things we've been doing. That's it. And you were with the ambassadors. Oh, that's right. That <laughs> was a highlight. So we had our ambassadors, but you can talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mike? Um, so I will not be here for the next board meeting. So let me just proactively report out two things I'll be doing. I'll be going to the Masters of Governance class on Friday. And we will also be meeting with the Castor Valley Educational Foundation, uh, I believe next week. And then I do have a request to our fellow board members. I think it could be um, useful for us to have uh, staff look into various vaccination requirements um, to understand, uh, could we adopt uh, measures to, in support of COVID-19 vaccinations for those who are able to get it? Um, but I was hoping we could just sort of generally just get information about what general requirements there are for vaccination Maybe we could discuss it at a future board meeting as an item or maybe a special meeting. So I just wanted to see if there's any support to have that at a future date. I'm finished. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I went to the, uh, the special ed regional policy board uh, meeting meets about four times a year. Um, there are a number of different things that we uh, took a look at. Um, and uh, let's see, um, of course we have representatives from Castro Valley, San Leandro, San Lorenzo and Hayward School Districts. So there's one board member and then uh, there's one, the uh, special ed directors. And then there's like a recording secretary and a few other people. We had a, a very good presentation from Megan Bello, who is the workability coordinator, who is um, stationed here in Castro Valley, but works with students from all four districts. A uh, very wonderful presentation from her, doing a great job there. And uh, let's see, SELPA funding. <laughs> okay, I didn't really write what that was about, but uh, <laughs> I just wrote about it. Yeah, we didn't actually vote on anything about funding. Okay, at this meeting, I think there was just some other note. Uh, there is some partnership with the Department of Rehab for workability and um, in Pleasanton uh, matches for their money. Um, so uh, there was that. The other thing that I did was I think mentioned uh, oh, yes. It, uh, I was at the uh, Stanton Parent Association. Uh, Parveen was there, Gina uh, Faria, and uh, Justin Kemp, who I believe is the president of the, um, of the Parents Association there. And that was very interesting. And it was really very good to visit with the Stanton people and their 
um, really quite a uh, wonderful parents there and, and uh, very involved in their school and making everything really work quite well. Oh, and the other thing, there was a little tiny bit, of course, um, um, some interaction with Dot and I on the naming committee. Um, so the Eden Area ROP, we had a special board meeting um, to discuss uh, hiring of COVID staff. So right now the superintendent and her staff are doing all of the contact tracing and it's taking a lot of time, you know, how much time it is. So there's a special board meeting to approve a uh, position for, for the um, school year, the remainder of the school year. Um, and aside from that, the Parent Leadership Council is the only other thing that I have represented us in. Good, thank you. Um, a couple of things that I was at, one, oh, actually both of them were mentioned before, the Spanish uh, immersion language for uh, beginning in elementary schools uh, that committee is underway and had a really excellent meeting last night. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ryman and Nia, who's no longer here, but great job on running that meeting and getting it started. Uh, this is one of my long-term hopes for our district would be that every student would graduate fluent in two languages. Um, also, the ambassador's visit to Castro Valley High School was really outstanding. Uh, we had about 15, I guess, something like that. And they had a really terrific evening, which is really excellent for us. This is a group of uh, influential citizens in the community who have no direct contact to the school system. And uh, so we were wanting to reach out to them and help them understand what we're doing here in the schools. Um, and that went extremely well. They got to see some good things over at the high school. So we'll mention at Rotary yesterday, we had a terrific speaker. Was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday on the uh, Afghan relief program. Uh, this is Parveen brought this speaker to us. And I'll tell you, we are gonna, I've heard two numbers now on the number of Afghan refugees we're gonna get in Alameda County. One number is 150, but another number was 350. So I'm not sure which one's right, but we're certainly gonna get a number of refugees from Afghanistan uh, in the not too distant future. So, um, and my last thing I'll say, it has nothing to do with the school board, but in my other uh, manifestation, I've attended several meetings of the Public Health Commission, and I'm just sort of trying to figure out what goes on there, but uh, a very interesting group there. So, Thanks to everybody who's here tonight, all the people who made presentations from the high school and the various other groups, and thanks to everybody who's still online with us. So uh, we will see you again in a couple of weeks. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.